Thank God for the delay. Those are the words I remember Lanus saying as he prayed for us on the side of the road somewhere between Tipoli and Conj, Haiti. Thank God for the delay. Do you ever wonder just how much God is in our lives? Those words I heard in Haiti that day made me wonder. You see, we had taken the youth to Tipoli for the day. If you can imagine about 14 of us in an extended cab Toyota pickup truck, nine or ten riding in the back, that was the scene. We got to experience the market. We even bought a pig. Yes, a live pig. We walked across the swinging bridge built by the Virginia Tech students, and we spent an amazing day with a bunch of kids in Tipoli. And after a busy day, we loaded the pig up and we headed back to Jane Chalker's house, riding down the insanely bumpy road once again. Well, those rocks are big and some are even sharp. And then it happened. The tire blew out. This didn't seem like a big deal at first. We had a spare until we realized that someone had sat on the valve stem and the spare was flat too. Fourteen people on the side of the road where very little traffic passes by. Now what? Well, thank goodness for cell phones, even in underdeveloped countries. Lanus got on the phone and he quickly called someone for a tire while the youth tried to find a shady spot to rest while we waited. About an hour later, a spare tire showed up on the back of a motorcycle. The tire was quickly changed and the youth, along with the live pig, were loaded back up and we very quickly tried to get back to the house so we could get out of the heat. But not until Lanus prayed for us. Thank God for the delay. I wonder, do we think in those terms? I think more often than not, we don't. If we get behind a slow car, if we have to turn around because we forgot something at home, if we get a flat tire, we're not very happy about it. We have plans. We needed to be there five minutes ago. If we look back at the history of Paul, this meeting with Lydia almost didn't happen. There's a long list of unforeseen events that led to this chance meeting. In the prior verses in this passage, we're even reminded that as a church, that God is in charge of the mission, that the church often searches for God's calling in mistaken directions, and that, God, and that God's spirit often speaks through frustrating and difficult discernment. This might even be said for our own lives. What do we learn through difficult discernment? The book of Acts gives us a glimpse of how the early church was established. It wasn't easy. There was controversy over preaching the gospel to the Gentiles. And it can be said that the apostle Paul was responsible for the spread of the church. But where he was to go was not always as obvious. He and Silas were on a preaching mission while on their way to Europe. But they had been nudged and redirected over and over again before they actually made it to Philippi. They stumble around the region, running into one barrier after another. The Spirit kept them from going south and west to Asia, and from going north to Bithynia. And Paul appears to be hearing God's continual, no, not that way. It's hard to listen to where the Holy Spirit is leading us to go, isn't it? It was hard for Paul and Silas to listen to. Twice in this scripture, we hear that the Spirit prevented Paul from going the wrong way. Paul had a vision of meeting a man in Macedonia that was pleading for help. Did they ever actually meet that man? Or was Lydia the one that they were supposed to meet all the time? Have you ever felt like the Holy Spirit was taking you down a different path? Have you ever asked, how did I get here? I was at a retreat last Saturday for United Methodist clergy in our conference that are local pastors, just like I am, who have not yet completed their education, just like me. The bishop spoke to about a hundred of us in the room. He told us, told us of his first appointment in 1968. It was a student appointment as a local pastor. He said he had gotten the call a few days after Martin Luther King was assassinated. He reflected on how difficult that time in history for our country was. And he reflected on all the precious moments in life that people had allowed him to share in, as well as all the challenges and struggles. The bishop will retire at the end of August this year, and he said, I still ask myself till this day, 
How did I get here? I was surprised to hear the bishop say that. You see, I ask myself that question every day. How did I get here? I wasn't raised in church. I didn't even know the true meaning of Easter until I was an adult. In fact, I could give you a whole list of reasons why I should not have the great opportunity of being in ministry with all of you here today. But I can also look back and I can see how God was in my life, guiding me, placing people in my life at the right times. And all I can say is, thank you, God. I wonder if that's what Lydia was saying or thinking when she looked back on that day, the day she met Paul and Silas on the bank of a river, after she had heard God's word through Paul, after she had been baptized. Thank you, God. Paul and Silas weren't headed there, and I think we overlook a huge detail in this story. Paul and Silas are two strange men in town that meet a woman. That was considered unheard of during this time. Sometime around the end of the first century, this sort of encounter would have been considered outrageous. Women and men, especially strange men meeting, this simply didn't happen. And Lydia is not your typical woman of the day either. We are told she is a worshiper of God and a dealer of purple cloth. Now you might be thinking, well, okay. But we have to remember that the writer of the book of Acts is describing an unconventional situation. The very idea of a woman conducting business was not a normal occurrence. I, can, I think we can relate to this. We might consider in our own lives that we are unconventional at times, or that a situation is unconventional. Lydia was an out-of-towner from Thyatira, not only selling valuable cloth, but also wearing the color purple, which was a statement of status and wealth. It was the Gucci handbag or the Rolex watch of the first century. There's also no man in this scripture which suggests that Lydia was the head of her household. Lydia is traveling in the public realm, selling her wares. She is not poor. She's not Jewish. She's not a Gentile. She's considered a God-fearer. She's not part of any organized religion, but she does believe in God. And she happens to be at the river when Paul and Silas show up. They have been traveling, proclaiming the good news about Jesus Christ, but they are unable to find a synagogue in Philippi. They figure a synagogue is a great place to begin the work that they are about to do. What a better place to start sharing the message of Jesus Christ, but to those who already believe in God, right? So with no synagogue... Then any Jew or believer in God that happened to be in town or passing through town knew to meet at the river on the Sabbath day for prayer. So Paul and Silas head down to the riverside, hoping to preach the gospel, never imagining that they would find only women. And the scripture tells us that Paul and Silas sat down and spoke to the women who had gathered there. A certain woman named Lydia, a worshiper of God, was listening to them. We are then told that the Lord opened her heart to listen eagerly to what was being said by Paul. And then we are told that Lydia and her household were baptized, and Lydia invited Paul and Silas to her home, and they went. This took the obedience of Paul and the faithfulness of Lydia. A chance meeting such as this might make you wonder, it makes me wonder, does everything really happen for a reason? I've heard this said very often, and I can't say that I believe that because our human actions are all part of that. But our obedience and our faithfulness are also part of that. I believe that God shows up wherever we are. Adam Hamilton says it well in a book he wrote, When Christians Get It Wrong. Hamilton posts a question in a blog, When do Christians get it wrong? A young woman responds to his blog, our baby died last spring at six weeks old. So many Christians we have enc encountered since that time tell us this was God's plan. The young woman says, Before this happened, I guess that's how I thought life worked too. But there is no way that the death of an innocent six-week-old child or the inability for my husband and I to get pregnant again is some, sort, is some part of some master plan. And if it is, then I'm simply not interested in a God with that plan. So does everything happen for a reason? 
Change is coming not only to our church, but to our community. Two people that have guided us in ministry and have taught our children for the last eight years are moving from Highlands. They're being called to lead a new community, a new congregation. It's hard when we lose our leader, isn't it? We know the church is bigger than a building, and we know the church is bigger than a conference or a bishop or a district superintendent. We even know that the church is bigger than a pastor. But we don't always see Christ. And as Christians, when we don't see Christ, we follow someone who exemplifies Christ to us. Pastor Paul has done that, and we have followed A few weeks ago, a lifelong member of this church came to me and he said, can we talk? He said, I've been a member of this church for over 40 years, but I've only been really involved for the last five. And you know why that is, Jen? Paul came to me one day after church and he asked me for my help with something. He's been leading me ever since. My response to him was, but you know what? You had to be willing to be led. Just like with Paul and Lydia, we come to the center of our story, the moment of intersection between human obedience and divine initiative. Longing and grace met on the bank of a river. Longing and grace met in the narthex of this church on a Sunday morning. The longing heart was opened by the gracious act of a faith-giving God in one simple action. Looking back, we can say that our steps were guided and our hearts were opened. Where is God guiding our steps, church? Where is God calling us to open our heart? Maybe this is the question that we ask as we partake in this meal that we call Holy Communion this morning. Where is God guiding us, each of us, to open our heart? Amen.